Let's look and remember a little bit from last week. And um, I want you to see this, the review. Number one, Paul and Titus had about 18 plus years together. We don't know the exact dates. Um, We are putting this together mainly from uh, the New Testament record of all of the writings of the New Testament, but also from history around the New Testament. We're able to surmise and identify certain markers that give us this picture. Notice the outline that is here of the, of the timeline. This is important for you to see. Those numbers are actually years. Uh, there's no 19 in front of it because this was 2,000 years ago. There's no 20 in front of it because it was around 2,000 years ago. Paul's conversion to Christ is around the very same year that Jesus would have been crucified on the cross, rose again, and then ascended to the Father, commissioning the disciples to go do their thing, to go tell the word, tell the world um, of who Jesus is and what he has done. But here we see that Paul's conversion comes around that time, just as the church was being begun. And so he gives an early visit to Jerusalem. Um, About 14 years later, he gives an early visit to Jerusalem. And that's what we have out there, Galatians 2. That's what we read last week. And he had somebody with him on that early visit to Jerusalem. He was going as a Jewish leader. Paul was a Jew. And as a Jewish leader, he was going to talk to the Jewish Christian leaders that had become Christians to clarify that he was going to the Gentiles. He was going to go to the non-Jews. He was going to check things out, make sure everything was okay, as they would give their blessing, as they would recognize that this gospel of Jesus Christ isn't only for Jews. It's not only for the chosen people of the Old Testament, but it is for all the world, the non-Jews as well. And so that's part of the picture of that early visit to Jerusalem. Then we see the first missionary journey, second missionary journey, third missionary journey, and then here we're going about 18 or 19 years later, Paul leaves um, and writes to Titus in Crete. And so the idea is he leaves Titus in Crete, and he writes to Titus in Crete, and that's what we've been studying in this little letter. And then eventually Paul is beheaded in Rome. Christian tradition tells us that he was martyred, and uh, most accounts agree that he was beheaded in Rome. So um, notice this. There's a little asterisk that's out to the side um, of each one of these points, and there's there's a specific reason that I'm showing you this. The little asterisk means what? Titus is present during some portion of that time. So notice all of these events in there, the early visit to Jerusalem, second missionary and third missionary journey, and then some of the others. But we see numerous events over all of these years that Titus is with him. Um, And and it could have been even in the 14 years before that first visit to Jerusalem, shortly after the Damascus Road experience. We don't know when Titus came to faith and eventually came into there, but it was at least 18 years. Now, you remember the, the island was out there in the middle of the Mediterranean. We've looked at these pictures before. For those of you that are new to us, this is the picture. The, the gospel is going all over the Mediterranean world. And there's this little island called Crete that's there in the middle of things. And it's about 150 miles long. So I said it's a little island. It's actually a big island. Had many different cities all over it. You can see the cities. And that island, believe it or not, is still there today. Um, You can go visit it. It's a beautiful Mediterranean island. Uh, About 600,000 people live on that island now. Um, But this is back 2,000 years ago as churches had been established and those churches were in trouble. And they had some very serious issues. Now, one of the things that we studied last week was the fact that Paul and Titus had confronted some very serious issues as they established churches. And I want you to remember what some of these issues were. These these 18 years had not been easy years. These had been hard years of going out into a lost world and proclaiming a Savior has come. He came, he lived, he died, he rose again from the dead, and he calls his people to come and believe upon him. He calls them to come together in church, uh, in church settings, and establishing a godly movement of those who believe in Christ. So the ministry expanded to and through non-Jews. So the church started out mainly with all Jews coming to faith in Jesus. But eventually, not only is the gospel for 
the non-Jewish believer, but it's also, it's going to be preached through non-Jewish believers. So the power base of Jerusalem is gone. The power base of the Jews being the exclusive people of God, that certainly others could come into the faith, but they were the, the, they were the conduit through which God brought the Messiah. Well, that is no longer the exclusive way in which God is using the nation of Israel. Now we see that this, this issue of it's no longer necessary that you be Jewish, it's that you believe in Jesus. And so the picture is that was a controversial issue. It came up several times, and there were many, many controversies that were around that. Look at the next part here, confronting ungodly behavior in the church of Corinth. It was, the, it was Titus who delivered Paul's letter to Corinth, and that first letter was a scathing rebuke because they were very, very ungodly. Look at the third one there. It is a correction of false doctrines. That's exactly what they were doing. For 18 years together, they were helping churches get straightened out from the common falls. Now, this is so helpful to us because, friends, nothing has changed. That, that nothing has changed in 2,000 years. There are always attacks upon God's truth. The amazing thing is God's truth moves forward um, far greater than any great battleship through a rough sea. God's word is eternal. It never changes. It is beautiful. It is complete. It is sufficient for everything, but it must be proclaimed. It's the God's people that need to embrace his word from culture to culture, from decade to decade, century to century, even millennia to millennia. So false doctrines are always coming. Now, the advantage for us is in this day and time, we get to see the example of how to confront wrong thinking about God, wrong thinking about the world. Because we see people like Paul and Titus and Peter and others deal with these issues, and they deal with it sometimes in failure, sometimes they, they struggled greatly, sometimes there was conflict, sometimes there was disagreement, but by God's grace, we see the gospel prevail and how that happens. Titus was in the middle of those struggles. Look at the last one that is there. They are establishing godly leaders for numerous churches in Crete. That's what he was left behind to do. This is what Paul and Titus were working on together. Paul leaves, and he leaves him to do this. I want you to see a quote from Dr. John Maxwell. He was a pastor in Southern California before he went into various other kinds of things, both evangelism and motivational speaking. And notice what he says here. Everything rises and falls on leadership. Everything rises and falls on leadership. Now, this is a phrase that we could look at that and say, everything? I mean, really, everything? Especially when it comes to the life of the church. You mean, everything? I mean, does this, what, what does that exactly mean? I want to say for the world, that can become a very, very carnal mentality of, and, that, and that's, that's sometimes why we see such pride and arrogance or such power associated around leadership. But in the life of the church and in the life of God's scheme and God's plan and God's grand design, it's not about pride. It's not about power. It's not about just mere influence. It's very different than that because the greatest leader in the universe is who? God. God, the greatest leader of all. Yes, indeed. The Lord Jesus Christ, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And so ultimately we see that leadership really does determine everything. And I want you to notice this. In Titus chapter 1, we see that the first thing that Paul is telling Titus to do in straighten out, straightening out these messed up churches is to come and to deal with the leadership issue. On your outline there, you see the box that is there, and that's the passage that Tommy read in verse 5. It says, this is why I left you in Crete, that you, you may put into order what, or put um, what remained into order and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. And then he goes on, verse 6, 7, 8, and 9, to describe what those leaders, what those elders are to look like. 
And that is what we're going to look at as we see that it matters not only for the churches in Crete, but it matters for us as we look at the issue of leadership. Now, notice here with me that First Titus, or Titus chapter 1 and verse 5 says, it should prompt us to deeply consider the utter importance of leadership. We need to deeply consider, we need to ponder this, we need to remember the utter importance, the tremendous importance of leadership. One of the first things that I want you to recognize and write this in is, is that leadership is all around us everywhere. Leadership is all around us everywhere. We're human beings that live on the earth together, and there's all kinds of things that are going on around us, and there's all kinds of different aspects of our lives that have leaders in them. And I want you to notice these bullet points off to the right. The very first one that we're already talking about here is what? We're talking about church. So you could put on here that church, this is the immediate context, this is what draws us to this attention, this subject here, but it's not just about church leadership that I want you to see this. I want you to, for a moment, think with me about school. Can you just imagine if you had 2,000 high school students over at South Broward High School or at Hollywood Hills or at MacArthur or any one of those places and there were no leaders present? What would happen? The buildings would fall down. They would burn them down. They would tear them down. I mean, it would be mayhem. It would be utter mayhem. I, I think about Patrick Lacuti, who serves in our church, and he is a principal of a church, I mean, excuse me, of a school in North Miami, a public school in North Miami, with over 2,000 high school students in North Miami. And Patrick has one of the biggest jobs in the world being in a secular high school, a tremendous place of ministry, a tremendous opportunity, but probably one of the most stressful places. But can you just imagine if Patrick and all of his teachers said, ah, we're not coming today. Can you imagine if the kids all showed up and there was no leadership there? You see, leadership is very important in a school context, in any school context, here at Sheridan Hills Christian School as well. What about work? You say, wow, it'd be wonderful to go to work and not have any leader. My job would be so much easier. But would it really, would it last? What would happen if there was, if there was no leadership in that? Do you, do you think, by and large, that, that would work out very well? No. I mean, people would start to go, wow, I can surf on the Internet. I can play video games. I can make travel plans. I can, I can not show up. Um, or I can build it this way instead of that way. Um, you see, work requires that there would be leadership. Think about government. If there was no, I, I know that we often complain about our leadership in government, and I completely agree. From Congress to the White House to everything, we look at the whole thing, and we, we go, my, my, my. But imagine, as much as we complain about that, imagine if there was no leadership. The United States would descend into total anarchy. Even though we have churches, even though we have Christians, even though we have level-minded, educated people that are part of the population, I can guarantee you that the country would come off the rails. Can you imagine a military with no leaders? Can you imagine a military without a single leader? Oh, we've just got soldiers. That's all we have. We just have sailors. We just have pilots. And we think that, you know, there's no need for this. What would happen? The ships would sink. The planes would crash. The, the soldiers would kill each other. I mean, you know, I, I, I don't know what would happen exactly, but we, we just have to have leadership. This is part of the way it works. It's simp you, you would say that would be impossible. It's ridiculous to even propose a military without leaders. What about medical? You're sitting there. You go to the doctor. You say, gee whiz, I'm having all these chest pains. I don't know what's going on, doc. What in the world? Can you imagine if there was no leadership in the doctor's office or at the hospital? I mean, you know, I mean, you might have a guy that loves to paint lines in the parking lot show up in the OR. Hey, let me help out. No, please, I'd rather you not do that. There would be great concerns. But we, we, we see that leadership is incredibly important in each one of these areas. <laughs> Can you imagine a sports team without a leader? 
Would that work very well? John Maxwell tells of a, uh, a sales manager of a company, a pretty big company, that had a great product that was looking at all of their numbers, and they said, these numbers are not, are not very good. We're not selling as much as we need to sell. And so they pulled together the whole sales team, and in the process of all of that, the lead sales guy was there just kind of berating everyone, saying, hey, this isn't working. You're not meeting your numbers. You're not getting the deals closed. You're not presenting the product. We have a great product. We're all privileged to represent this product, and you guys are not doing very good. Look at the numbers. And then he looked down at a brand new professional football player that had joined their team. He had retired from the NFL. He was on their team. And he looked down there and he called out the professional football player and he said, Will you just tell me if you were on that team and everything is not going very well, what does the coach do? And the NFL player just kind of looked up and said, Well, if it was as bad as you're describing it, we would probably get a new coach. You see, leadership is important. We, we have to recognize that leadership is around us and it's everywhere. I want you to notice another thing that is here. Leadership determines much about our lives. It, it, it determines much about our lives. Um, if, there, if there's not leaders in the county or in the state, we don't have roads in which we can move around. We don't have fuel coming to the places where we need fuel. We don't, we don't have security. We don't have law enforcement to rein in the wicked human heart. And so it determines much about our lives. Notice the third one that is here. Leadership can bless us or what? Or curse us. You look through the Old Testament, you see some of the leaders were very good and godly leaders, and the people prospered under them. You look through the Old Testament, and you see that some of the leaders were evil leaders, and there was brought, brought about great despair and great trouble. We look through human history, and we see that there are some leaders who have done marvelously in helping the people that they lead, and we see other leaders who brought great destruction. In fact, fill this in, there's another way in which which difficulty comes, the leadership's absence leads to destruction. If there is a lack of leadership, if there's a void of leadership, it will be filled with other leadership in some way, shape, or form that very often brings destruction. In God's Word, we see that where the people have no vision, and you could, you could interpret that in saying where the people have no leadership, giving that vision and bringing the people to a certain place, they, there's despair and there's eventual destruction. Um, this week, as in when I was preparing for this message, I just noticed in the news that in India, a book has just been published for children's ministry, and it says, Great Leaders. And in the Great Leaders industry book, this, this book published in India, it has Adolf Hitler as one of the great leaders of the world. Go to the next slide there so they can see that. You see there at the bottom of the picture. When asked about it, they said, oh, well, he was a passionate leader for the, the German nation. And some would say, wait a minute, not everybody in Germany. In fact, there were millions of Jews who were exterminated and, and millions of other people. And if you were handicapped in Germany, Germany and uh, you were eliminated by the Third Reich because you were a burden to society, you see, it, it, leadership can bring about blessing or g leadership can bring about great curse and great difficulty. So it's not, it's not strange to us that the very first thing, and fill this in, that leadership is the very first thing that Paul mentions to Titus and to the Cretans. It's, it's really the very first thing that comes up. He's saying, if we have issues, we have to deal with the leadership. It is safe to flip your page there. Look at the top of the page. We circle back on the last verse that is there in verse 4 in the box on the top of the page. It says, to Titus, my true child in a common faith. So 18 plus years together, they've been serving the Lord along with others. There was Timothy as well and Barnabas and Silas and others, but Titus is one of them. Grace and peace from God the Father in Christ Jesus our Savior. Verse 5, this is why I left you in Crete, so that you might put what remained into order and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. 
I want you to notice this, and you can fill this in, that Titus 1 verse 5 points to spiritual reform and leadership. He's saying if you're going to straighten things out, if these people are going to prosper as being godly people involved with godly churches, if their lives of faith are going to be successful, there must be spiritual reform and leadership. Notice this, and I bolded this right here underneath that first point. It says, this is why I left you in Crete. Notice the statement is there. While this letter is addressed to Titus, it is likely that Paul intended that it be read to the churches as well. This would make Titus's job much easier. Now, if this was a small setting, I would open it up and let you comment on why would this be easier. You see, I... I, I Think that you kind of know what happens when somebody is given a tough job to do and you have a sole leader that's going to forge ahead in bringing reform. It's awfully helpful if he has what? If he has backup. If he has, yes, support. And so what we see here is that Paul is writing really not just to Titus. He is empowering Titus to do some very heavy lifting in some messed up churches. And so notice this, that it would make jo his job much easier. You see, this is Paul's authority is stamped on Titus. He's being commissioned with this. And here's the hint that is here. Titus would have known why Paul was leaving Crete. He knew that. We, we already, I mean, he, Paul wouldn't have, have left with, without some issue of plan here. This, was, this would have been known. I believe that this is the, the big picture of this letter is intended not only to make sure that, that Titus had a good plan, but it was also to help the people see it. Notice the next part of this here. So that you might put what remained into order. To put into order, that's actually one word together, even though in English we've separated what remained that is here. And it's a very interesting word. It's epite ortho, and it's, it's, kind of, it's three different parts mixed together, and it means to straighten out. Now, what's kind of interesting there is, has anybody in this room ever had braces, orthodontic braces, or has anybody ever paid for orthodontic <laughs> braces? Anybody in this room? Okay, it's affected almost all of us financially or with our mouth, right? This is where we get, it's, it's this, uh, the ortho is the idea of straightening. That means to straighten. And in this case, it means to straighten it out, to work it out and to make it straight. It's crooked, you gotta get it straight. And so that's, that's the picture that is here. Um, he says, so that you might put what remained in order, so that you might straighten out the issues. That's what Paul is giving Titus to do. While we don't know specifically what remained to be done exactly, it's obvious that there were major problems and the issues had to be sorted out. Now, I've asked you to turn in your Bible, and I want you to go to Titus chapter 1. It goes first and second Timothy, and then to Titus. If you're in Hebrews, you're too far, so back up a little bit. And just notice, here is Titus, the whole letter of Titus in my Bible, these two pages. Do you see where it is on your Bible? It's a very short letter. It's only three chapters. It's very easy for you. I want to encourage you each week as we're studying this to weave into your week reading the book of Titus at least one time. It's, it's only three chapters. You can do it in a matter of minutes. You could do it on a break at work. Um, I want to encourage you to do that. But I want you to see with me that there were e issues, major issues that were having to be worked out. First of all, look with me in first Titus, or I, not first Titus, Titus 1.10. Look at verse 10. It says, for there are many who are what? Insubordinate. Did anybody get accused when they were in elementary grade of being called insubordinate? I remember that one. But look at verse 10. For there were many who are insubordinate, empty talkers and deceivers, especially those of what? The circumcision party. Now, you remember last week we looked at the fact that these were, these were Jewish people that were saying, oh, you want to be a Christian? You have to become Jewish first. And part of being Jewish for the males, that means you have to be circumcised. 
And so they were seeking to infuse the law upon Greek people that didn't even come from a Jewish background. They were seeking to infuse the Old Testament Jewish law upon that. And here we see that this is being confronted. They're saying that these circumcision part, these Judaizers, they're, they're, they're called Judaizers to seek to make you Jewish before making you Christian. This was simply wrong theology. This was wrong thinking. No, what you are called to do is to believe upon Christ. The law has been fulfilled in Christ. Look what it says in verse 5. This is why I left you, or excuse me, verse 10. For there are many who are insubordinate, empty talkers. So there's, these are the people that are there in the churches. They're, they're just kind of saying nothingness. They're, they're talking about things that don't matter constantly. Look at that. There's deceivers that are there. So what all are they deceiving? Perhaps for control, perhaps for sexuality, perhaps for money, especially those of the circumcision party. So it, it's, it's all wound up in that. Look at verse 11. They must be silenced since they are upsetting whole families by teaching for shameful gain what they ought not to teach. Now let me tell you, friends, before you zone out and you think, well, how is the book of Titus going to affect me in my life in 2018? I mean, you have no idea what I dealt with this week. Listen, the book of Titus is one of the things that can keep your local church family on the rails in a healthy church. The concepts that are here are essential for your Christian life. That we would be a healthy church, that we would not be one of these churches that is blown around by every wind of doctrine, that we would not be a church that just simply is like a chameleon blending in with the world around us, but that we would be a church that recognizes what does God's word say and how are Christians supposed to live until we stand before him. You see, throughout the ages, we see that churches get carried off and deceived into wanting to just be like the world. And the Christians within those churches very often get carried away with the same enticements. And for many, they never even have the chance to come into faith with Jesus Christ because the gospel has been lost. It's no longer being preached. And so what happens is that we become an organization that loves to come together, kind of a, you know, a, a Christian country club, and, you know, it's kind of nice, and we, we come in, and we do our things, and we have fellowship, and we kind of know each other, and very, before very long, we're deceived into thinking that I'm okay, you're okay, God's okay, everybody's okay, and, and we just are being this religious, nice person. We just read the book, Conversion. And in the book Conversion, chapter 1 deals with the fact that you're called to be new, not nice. Now, that doesn't mean don't be nice. But for so very long, moralistic, therapeutic deism has been taught in churches that's just saying, you just need to be a nice person. You just need to be a good person. And if you'll be a good person, then God will accept you. Friends, that is heresy. That is diametrically opposed to what God's Word says about how we come into a relationship with God. The only way that we can come into a relationship with God is simply to come before Him and let Him make us completely new. The Bible calls that being born again. It calls that coming into a relationship with God where by the power of His Holy Spirit, He washes over us with His blood. It is not a sensational, experiential pre preoccupation. It is simply by faith that we see and hear that Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world and all who trust in Him can be saved from their sins if they will turn to Him in belief. This is the beautiful gospel. This is the reason that we come together. This is the reason we sing about Jesus and not each other. This is the reason, oh, I'm so thankful for my pastor. I'm so thankful. You don't sing pa songs about your pastor. You don't sing songs about your beloved grandmother who was a Christian. What we sing is about Jesus, the Savior who died on the cross for us. This is the picture of what Titus is being told to help the churches in Crete reclaim. And if we don't pay attention to it, we will belong to a church that is very messed up, like churches all around us. 
There are some great churches around us who hold on to this message, but there are many churches around us who are even just disappearing because they left the gospel, and if you don't have the gospel, over a period of time in this increasingly secular culture, the churches will simply disappear. Go look at Europe. Over the last 500 years, that, that is largely what has happened, except for a beautiful remnant of Bible-believing Christians who have held on to the gospel. They came through the Reformation. They held on to France. They're called the Huguenots at one point, and at various others, evangelicals that still today hold on to the gospel of Jesus Christ all across the world. We are called to that remnant. We just sang about that remnant. Um, we just read about it in Micah chapter 7, the remnant of God, the remnant of, his, of those who follow in him. And so this is what we must hold on to, church. This is what we must pay attention to. Leadership is important because there's things very often that have to be straightened out, and we see that in the book of Titus. Look at the next phrase there. It comes out of verse 5, and it says that Titus is to appoint what? Are you all here? Appoint what? Elders. Appoint elders in every town as I directed you. That's another hint that, that Titus really knew what was going on, that this letter is helpful to Titus, obviously, but it's really to the churches. And, and folks, we can take a lot of solace in that and a lot of encouragement in that, that this is, they had already been talking about what needed to happen. And so he is saying, appoint elders in every town. Now, what are elders? You say, we're Baptists, we don't have elders. Well, actually, we do. Um, I want you to see this. Elders comes from the word presbyteros, presbyteros, and that's a fancy word in Greek that simply means um, one who is either, there's two senses of it, one who is older, so it's actually having to do with age, referring to age, but it also, in the spiritual sense, and in this context, it's not just merely talking about one that is older, but more importantly, it's talking about one who is mature, talking about one who is mature, not just in age, not just in physical development. But this refers to authority through wisdom. Now, I want you to think about um, if you were to go to Africa. Many of you have studied enough about world cultures that you know that people in Africa or even people in South America still, and if you were to go to certain Native American tribes, um, what we call Native Americans here, that you would come together, and if there's a tribe of people, uh, this has largely been lost in our present day and time, but if there's a tribe of people, those people are led typically, yes, by a chief, but he would often work with what? He would work with the elders of their tribe. Um, just a couple of weeks ago, I saw again, um, while I was working on some things at the house, uh, I saw the movie um, Captain Phillips. And many of you remember that was a, about a, a ship that was held hostage um, off of Somalia. And um, that as they were negotiating with the pirates that were seeking to, kill, seeking to kidnap the ship and had the captain on hand, they were seeking to save out the captain from it. And as part of that, they said, hey, we're going to get the elders of your clan back in Somalia over here to help negotiate this. And that response, and that's a true part of the story. They use that strategy of saying, we are going to get, and so here's this young pirate, rebel, lawless guy that when they bring up the elders from his town and from his group, he suddenly is listening. You see, this is the authority in their lives. This is it. Now, he may not have been very afraid of the American government, and he may not have been very afraid of some other things, but he was kind of afraid of his elders from his tribe. And, and so we, we see that sense in this. It's a sense not merely of age, but it also has to do with the authority that is there. And not just anybody could be made an elder. Just because you reach you know, the age of 65 or just because you've reached the age of 75, that makes you automatically mature. Well, we know that that's not true. We, we know that there's the age, excuse me, maturity does not always depend upon how old someone is. There are some Christians who are very old that are very mature. And there are some Christians who are very old that are very immature. That there's, there's no faith, there's no obedience, or very little of it. There's no self-control in this. 
Um, there are some Christians that are very young that are very mature Christians that have, they have the gospel has come in and changed them, changed the way they think, it's changed the way they live. Their impulsiveness has been reined into Christ that they're seeking to live for Christ. So it doesn't merely have to do with age. It has to do with true maturity. And we see this throughout the Old Testament, excuse me, we see this throughout the New Testament in these letters that is here. Presbyteros, this is the next part here, Presbyteros, or elders, had previously been referred to to the Jewish leaders. And I want you to think about that, and you see there under that, the chief priests and elders. We see that throughout um, the book of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, as Jesus and as those, as those um, uh, gospel writers are talking about this. This is what they use. They use the word presbyteros when they're writing in Greek to describe the Jewish leaders. But as time goes on, by the year 60 AD, which would be where Titus is, it has become a common term for not just Jewish leaders, but church leaders. So it's the same concept. Um, and the, these are the apostles and the elders. We see that multiple times that the apostles are there and the elders are mentioned in the life of the church and in the story of the church from the book of Acts and various other places. In fact, and if you would, circle Acts chapter 20, verse 17 and 28, um, those, two, those two references, because it has to do with the very next point that is right here. The term elder or presbyteros and bishop, or episcopos, or pastor, or poimen, all three of these terms are used interchangeably. These are not talking about different levels of leadership. These are used interchangeably. In fact, we even see it in our text um, from the page that is here. He says, um, to appoint elders that are here, and then as you go down through the text, you see that they are to be overseers. That's the word um, for bishop or, presby or episcopos. In fact, above the bold word bishop, write overseer. That's the word that is there. It's called episcopos in the, in the Greek. Now, here's the point that we need to gain from this. In some denominations, there are various hierarchies of pastors and of spiritual leaders. We would say that that does not come from the Bible. Where that comes from, for the most part, that comes from Christian history in different structures of different movements that exist, whether it be the Catholic Church or the Episcopal Church or the Methodist Church or some of the others. And while we see the Apostle Paul doing things like appointing Titus to appoint leaders, we see that that was a special time in history that really was, was dealing with going from nothing to something. But after you go from nothing to something, we see more regula regulative um, principles of leadership as, as begin to unfold that don't have to do with a hierarchy of leadership. And it's mainly because when you see these in context, when you see these in the way that they're being used, they're being used very interchangeably from text to text. In fact, there's one section that uses all three of these in the same, um, in the same area in just a matter of a few words. So there are clearly one of two roles, the elder or the bishop or the pastor is clearly one of two roles in the New Testament. It's elder slash pastor, um, and deacon or servant. That's the idea that's here. These are the two groups that we see that are called to care for the church. We see this consistently through the book of Acts. We see this consistently through the letters of the New Testament, that both of these work together in caring for the church and helping the church. So I've already said it here, and you can fill this in. There are clearly not in a hierarchy in the New Testament. NT stands for New Testament. And so when, when we look at our Bible, when we look at the scriptures that are here, we, we don't see a hierarchy that is here. In fact, one of the main passages that, um, or excuse me, one of the main principles that Baptists believe very clearly is from the book, of, from the Bible, is the fact that we believe that each church is autonomous. That means each church governs itself. Each church does not answer to other churches somewhere else, some, in a, some other place. We see that Sheridan Hills is responsible before the Lord as a church. 
Nobody else is responsible for us outside of our church. Um, we, don't, we don't have to answer to the Southern Baptist Convention. We don't have to answer to the local association or to the state convention. Our involvement with the Florida Baptists, our involvement with the Gulf Stream Association here in Broward County, our involvement with the Southern Baptist Convention all over the United States is simply, is simply voluntary. In fact, we call it cords of sand. Cords of sand bonded together. Um, is a cord of sand going to bond anything? No, but it represents the fact that we are together, but it's not through a hierarchy, and it's not through an authoritative sense. We believe that the New Testament clearly teaches that churches are going to answer for themselves before the Lord. Notice the next part, just like individuals. Look at the next part here. Timothy and Titus, both of these men, both of these men that are, being, that are servants um, working with the Apostle Paul, Timothy and Titus receive a list of spiritual qualifications for spiritual leaders. They, they receive a list of who can lead. And these are, very, these are found in two places, Circle Titus 1, 5 through 9, and 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 7. Those are the two places where we see the lists that are given. And they're, they're slightly different, but they're largely the same. And I want you to notice this. It's just there underneath that. It's not about who is the most popular. It's not about the powerful, the rich, the eloquent, or the ambitious. But it's about God's specific, non-negotiable qualifications, and fill this in, that do not change. Throughout 2,000 years of church history, we would recognize that this is what God has set in order. This is, doesn't have anything to do with man's abilities and all of man's um, fleshly, temporal things. This has to do with spiritual qualifications, not social standings. Now, there are things that a pastor has to be able to do. There are things that a deacon has to be able to do in the life of the church. There's no, there's no doubt about that. But it has more to do with who he is in his character, and it has more to do with who he is before God. You see, here's, here's part of the issue, and you can fill this in. Cretan churches reveal that when unqualified men lead the church, it becomes fill it in, a fleshly mess. That's what happens when unqualified men lead the church. When it's more about politics, when it's more about abilities that have to do with earthly temporal things, when it has to do with just influence and power, when it has to do with just someone being nice, maybe it has to do with somebody just being faithful and showing up, when those are the ones that are the qualifications as opposed to God's qualifications, then churches become a mess. Notice here with me, false doctrine, manipulation, power struggles, greed, sexual immorality, selfishness, strife, and the list goes on and on and on, not only of the New Testament churches that went the wrong way, but of churches just a few miles from this building. Now, before we get to the very bottom, I just want you to think about this with me. Over the last 25 years, there has been an increasing speed at which church leadership has failed. As the world culture around us, and I believe as the time draws near for Christ to come, there's more and more and more deception there's more and more power of the culture, and there's more and more churches that haven't properly preached the gospel, haven't properly discipled its leaders, haven't properly, properly raised its leaders to where if you can get a crowd, you can be a church. The number of the crowd and the appeal to the masses becomes more important than the faithfulness to God. And one of the ways that we see that this really matters is because when one of those leaders really messes up, what does the church do? Over and over and over again, you see him right back in another pulpit somewhere else, 
where the church does not listen to the standard that this man must be above reproach. This man must be pure sexually. This man must, in fact, have a family that is pure. And so when we begin to let all of those things go and say, oh, well, that's not really what it means. That can't really be. And, you know, he repented. He repented. So it's fine. Can God restore spiritually a man who is who has brought great shame to the church in his, in his actions. Absolutely. The gospel is real even for messed up, fallen preachers. But listen, that simply, though, disqualifies him from some of the very clear qualifications that are here. And when churches lower and lower and lower the standard for who they will follow, and in fact violate the standards that we're going to study over the next couple of weeks, those churches wind up being destroyed. They don't have a gospel. Oh, they may have a crowd, but they're not building a true church. You see, when a pastor falls and when a pastor really makes a big mess, he takes down a lot of people with him. And there's no way around that because you have to be able to trust your pastors. But we're going to see, it's not just about one pastor, it's not just about a senior pastor, but what we're going to see in the next couple of weeks is this group of pastors. We see this team of pastors. We see the grammar that is used here is always plural. It's not just one. And so Sheridan Hills doesn't look to just one. Sheridan Hills looks to a group of spiritually qualified individuals that God has raised up. That is is the design. And we're going to see that clearly in Scripture. I mean, that, that will become very, very evident. And that's, that's a very important aspect to our church life. Friends, if we're not very, very careful about our views on leadership, if we're not very careful about our views on leadership generally, especially as it relates ultimately to God, then we will begin to follow anything and we will follow the world, we will be enticed by the world, we will be enticed by political ideas, or we will be enticed by economic ideas, or we will be enticed by fleshly, um, temporal, very often even sexual ideas, and other moralities that lead us away from God. God has called us to walk with him in spirit and in truth, remaining true to what his word says. That is exactly what Paul is hammering for Titus and these churches. Now, we talked about how leadership is everywhere in our lives, all these different aspects of our lives. I'd like you to fill this in and just ponder this as we finish. Do I acknowledge the importance of leadership in my life? Do I acknowledge that? Ask yourself that question. Do I acknowledge that? Do I recognize that I'm being led? I'm being led in many, many different ways. You see, this is, this is an important thing for us to think about. In American thinking, we often think about our independence. We often think about our liberty. We often think about our rights. Um... If you study French Revolution history, you recognize that the French Revolution was fueled by a desire to not only throw off the king, but also to throw off God. It was a revolution against the church, and it was a revolution against the king. Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette eventually beheaded, and the citizenry rises up, and this becomes the great narrative of the 1789 revolution in France. But it's not only what we see of that mentality that's down within the human heart, but we also see it in American individualism and even this idea of our own rights and our own freedoms. If we are not careful, we do not, as the original framers of the Constitution, recognize that this is under God but we throw off God to be kings ourselves, to be presidents ourselves. The, the rise of the individual as the center of 
our, not only our nation, but our mentality. So do I recognize the importance of leadership? You see, authority is a big deal. And God has called us to be people under authority. Look at the next part here. Do I desire good and godly leadership in my life? This is a key question for Christians. Do I desire good and godly leadership in my life, in every area of our lives? Is that our goal? Is that our hope? Is that our prayer? I want to encourage you that this is the mentality of true Christians, that we would say we are people under submission, submission to God, and listen to this, even submission to one another. That's part of the beauty of what it means to come into the family of Christ.